everybody or good good morning or evening wherever wherever you are and welcome to this first green inclusive and climate smart finance action group webinar after the summer break this is part of the action group webinar series uh, that as you know happen every two weeks I'm Joanna Afonso, Financial Inclusion Specialist at the European Microfinance Program Platform and the uh, coordinator of the action groups. So if you want to know more about the Green Action Group or any other of the currently active action groups, please um, look into our web page or you can send me a message on my email and we will be posting the, the email in the, um, in the chat. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Natalia Rialpe Carrillo, um, that most of you know already very well. She is the CEO of Edera Sustainable Solutions. She's also co-head of the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Action Group. Um, and she's also a guest lecturer at the Pan-African University Institute of Water and Energy, as well as a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability in Studies at the University of Potsdam in uh, Germany. Um, is as research fellow that she leads the R Impact Project that uh, she will be talking about during this presentation. Uh, this is an impact driven and action based research project studying energy, wash, and uh, food security related needs at the household level in developing countries. And I'm sure she will give you much more detail on this, on, on, on the project and how, how is, is it going. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, notes, please use the Q&A section that you have on the bottom of your screen for any questions that you want to, to put to Natalia, and you have also the possibility of using the chat for any additional comment that, uh, that you have. Um, we will start with a brief presentation of the action group and, and their activities and achievements, and then I will give the floor to Natalia for our presentation that will take about um, uh, 30 minutes, and that then will be followed by um, the Q&A and the discussion um, uh, following. So Natalia, um, if you want to probably start um we can start with the presentation of 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 the action group, the action group. Mm -hmm. okay thank you joanna for this introduction and welcome everybody to this webinar um not now i'm on the roll on the other side uh, but i'm very happy and glad to present you what we do at the um, green inclusive and climate smart finance action group which is a unique multi-stakeholder Think Tank for Environmentally Responsible Inclusive Finance, hosted by the European Microfinance Platform. Our objectives are to discuss the challenges and, and strategies in green inclusive finance, improve the knowledge and action, uh, such as what we are doing now with this type of webinar, enhance the cooperation among actors, increase this international attention. In our webinars, we have, um, and all our activities, we have participants from Latin America, from uh, North America, from Africa, um, from Asia. We are gathering every, every time more participants all around the world. And we develop dedicated tools that are recognized as standards in the inclusive finance sector, supporting green inclusive finance. And we will publish and disseminate these findings and results and enhance the interest and concrete commitment of stakeholders in the sector. The action group has been established in 2013. It was um, born in Berlin. And since then, it has had quite a track record and long-term commitment. We have over 135 members from more than 75 institutions. Some of them are listed here and uh, the action group is coordinated by me and Davide Forcella from Yapu Solutions um, and CERMI. And our achievements so far are, um, we have developed the green index, uh, the standards of or for environmental performance assessment, done also a catalog on green energy products. And we have conducted more than seven events. We conduct also trainings and have publications and e-learning platform. And some of um, the publications or work that we are doing in 
2020 and 2021 is the Green Index Study, launching of this webinar series, the development of the Green Index 3.0, uh, launching of an online library um, of materials related, related to green inclusive finance. We have uh, launched already our newsletter and are currently working on the action group uh, members map. And we are going to launch together with SPTF and CITES um, the development of the dimension seven of the universal standards for um, environmental performance, which is uh, parallel or the same as the green index where will um, the green index is a more in-depth tool. Our ongoing activities, um, besides from the ones that I already mentioned to you, include the preparation of two pagers and discussion papers and case studies uh, working with green heroes and macrofinance institutions that have implemented a green inclusive finance and the launching of the Green Index uh, 3.0, which will be a digital tool. Um, you can visit us to our website, uh, which is um, now finally uh, launched and new for you, where you will find all our materials and uh, like the, also the list of members, what are we doing? And you can also engage and join to our action group and also visit the online library, which is um, already, already online. And we, we will be gathering feedback on the tool, also use it. And if you have any comment, just uh, don't hesitate to drop us an email um, to Joanna Afonso that you will see the email on the last slide of this webinar. On the green index, uh, lastly, um, we have launched it in 2014. And since then, it has had quite a, quite a history or um, we had our first edition in 2014. Then um, in 2016, it was, well, it incorporated the lessons learned from MFIs. It was integrated into SPI4, only qualitative and also optional module. And now in 2021, we have had like all, all these lessons learned from more than thousand institutions thousand assessments that we have done across these um, six, six years. And we have done the whole alignment to international initiatives and now work the whole 20, not like the whole year on um, gathering feedback rounds from all the sector, from the FSPs, investors, and also open feedback. So we have, we have closed this last feedback round in the 30th of August and Important to share with you is that from um, October, we will start with trainings and also data collections for FSPs and investors. So if you are interested in this, um, also don't hesitate to approach us. Our webinar series um, take place every two weeks. We had a long summer break and I'm very happy to be the first one to uh, launch again um, these, these bi-weekly meetings. And now, now that we are um, over with this introduction, I am very pleased to start with the topic of today. Yeah. Uh, and Natalia, I will keep an eye on, on the questions and, and uh, let you know about them. Okay. So I plan to um, present to you in the following 20 minutes, uh, 2025, so that we can have also some 25 minutes of discussion and um, answering to your questions. So the topic of today is about identifying vulnerabilities um, or, and also like integrated into the Green Index 3.0 and uh, the relevance of uh, vulnerability and risks management. Uh, here are, we are talking about how to foster green inclusive finance by identifying these vulnerabilities. And I would like to share with you what are these insights from the Impact Art project that um, I've started in the framework of my fellowship, assessing access to basic services of microfinance customers and also the communities in rural remote areas. So the background is that um, as a research project, um, this fellowship is hosted by the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. Um, this fellowship is very special like for 
for the Institute and as a fellow as well. The Cluster for Sustainability Fellowship, it is only once a year. This is the second edition. And I've um, been awarded with, with this one to carry out um, this very ambitious project. And this uh, with the technical support of Edera um, using the digital tools um, that we have developed at, um, at Edera. So the objectives are to understand the vulnerabilities and measuring standard indicators from the bottom up, meaning from households, uh, to foster that data-driven products and services for microfinance institutions are also for NGOs working directly with communities. And after doing like the whole data collection campaigns to draw recommendations and suggestions for policymakers on not only on on how, no, how these products and services can um, improve livelihoods, but also about the methodologies, the frameworks, the tools um, that have been used and how is it possible to have standard indicators that are valid like across different geographies and uh, different countries. So today we are going to focus on this first objective, understanding vulnerabilities and in upcoming and presentations, I will then um, give a more in-depth look to data-driven products and services and also about the recommendations. So we will focus today only on, um, on this first process that we have had. So how was the approach of this project? We have, um, we work together with microfinance institutions or with NGOs um, located in different countries from Edera and the process has been that we provide this um, training, not through digital platforms and also with the digital tools for uh, their organizations where they use then um, digital tools for doing the data collection with households in order to understand what are the needs in regards to energy supply, to water and sanitation and hygiene, and also to food security. And then this data is analyzed and how we have um, worked as much as possible to automatize all types of processes that go behind um, the data collection, the validation, the data cleaning, the analysis and the reporting so that at the end it is possible to have data-driven decision-making processes. The participants of this project um, had, were, uh, are, almost like nine consortiums. I will present to you uh, six of them, of the ones that have already completed um, this, this first like data collection campaign. We have worked with Palmis, MFI Palmis in Haiti, with Rajanet George, um, the project coordinator, uh, supported by Entrepreneur du Monde, Eugenie Constancias, in Senegal with Fran Soto, with the project coordinator Ismail Sen, and in Uganda with Penda Capital, uh, with Andrew Mwesi. In Zambia, we work with the NGO Bogwasa, with Axon Banda, the project coordinator in Nepal, with the MFI Muktinath Vikas Bank. They were awarded the European Microfinance Award last year. And in Rwanda, with Sustainable Villages Foundation, with the project coordinator Joachim Hausstrop from um, from this NGO that it's based in Germany, but that work directly in Rwanda, okay? So the frameworks that we have applied are um, the multi-tier framework for measuring SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy for electricity supply, households and productive uses, and also for cooking solutions. In wash for drinking water and sanitation and water, drinking water, sanitation and hygiene at household level. We use the JMP program and the tools from UNICEF and the WHO. And for uh, food security and SDG2, we use the tool food insecurity experience scale. Um, that it's from the food and agriculture organization of the United Nations, and this was um, focusing at household level. So each of these frameworks, and they have already very structured surveys and questionnaires, and what we have done is to optimize them and 
digitize all these um, surveys so that loan officers in the field or the um, employees of the NGOs could do the data collection in their rural areas you know, or in their remote areas where they work. So the methodologies and tools in order to implement all these data collection campaigns, we use an e-learning platform um, for the remote uh, training process that we had um, from the beginning. We had also a tutorial app to teach about how the tools work. We had digital communication channels with all the teams and data dashboards and digital automated report. So in the e-learning platform, we shared um, the surveys so that each partner could comment and we could adapt according to the terms um, specific to the field. We also had like a webinar um, place or visual meetings where we could meet regularly and then um, share all the documentation over the e-learning platform. Then in the tutorial app, we had videos um, on explaining how like basic questions that people could have in the field. And if they don't have internet connection that they could go through the videos and then find out how to, how to deal with uh, the specific um, question that they might have. And the tool that the app was available in Spanish, French, and English. And then we had like communication channels in mostly on Telegram, but also in WhatsApp with each team, like um, introducing, doing the training, following up like every day or every, every time needed, um, how was the data collection ongoing? We have then also automated reports where this data like will feed like the graphs of what was happening in the field, um, what was, you know, how is the data, uh, what are the needs that have been identified? And for the organizations, they will have access also to reports where all the questions will have already like these automated tables and graphs of um, what, you know, like which data um, has, been, has been already collected, if it's a required question or not, and um, what was the, not the, um, how were the answers of, of these questions. On the dashboard, we had also the theory, like what are the frameworks about and what are they measuring? Um, so well, it's partly a tutorial of um, these standard indicators um, developed by these international organizations. And at the same time, we, had, um, we have like chapters where we will show already um, what were the, the results of the respondents. So the outreach of this was um, as of September 2021, we have covered the six countries and we have more than 4,000 4, households interviewed with more than 100 enumerator, enumerators trained uh, with these organizations and the next uh, data collections are in DRC, in Nicaragua and in India. So now on the key findings, we have on electricity supply, this is the multi-tier framework, which analyzes energy access based on different um, attributes. We have here affordability, availability, how is the capacity, the formality, quality, reliability, safety, and the overall index. And we see some differences. I will show you not like per, um, uh, not all the details, but I will show you at least some insights. We see, for instance, like the differences between um, the availability or like you know, the, the communities that were suffering the most, for instance, in Haiti, in terms of availability of electricity supply at day or not, and night, um, which was very low. And also the quality of the electricity supply in Nepal with a lot of outages. So you, know, you will see, like uh, comparing the results, we see, um, large differences in, in terms of quality, availability, and also capacity of the electricity supply. Then on clean cooking solutions, we have um, also you know, in Rwanda um, problems with the availability and also the exposure, like which type of fuel uh, will they use. In Senegal, the convenience, people spending um, lots of hours collecting the firewood and also preparing the firewood for cooking. While affordability um, was rather an issue in Haiti, 
And in Senegal, um, but not that much, like in Rwanda, because they were collecting, mostly collecting the food. Um, and then here in safety, like some cases with some accidents um, or risks to, for health when using the fuels or cook stoves in other households. On WASH, we have um, here um, the frameworks for drinking water, for sanitation, and for hygiene. And it is measured um, like on this scale from no service up to safely managed, from open defecation up to a basic, having a basic toilet, and no facility for hygiene up to basic. So now here we see the main differences like in hygiene for Haiti and Nepal, which was limited scale, no facility, and in Rwanda with um, no drinking water supply and people having um, collected water from, from the rain. Yeah. And then on food security, we use this food insecurity experience scale uh, framework from, from the FAO. And here, like according to this framework, not the methodology goes like um, the PPI working. So for those that already know this, this tool, it's about the probability of being vulnerable. So here, if we compare is here, like we have almost 20% of having, so 20% of the population um, have a high probability to be above the moderate food insecurity threshold or above the severe uh, food insecurity threshold. So these are like the, the, uh, the important like statistics to look at. And, um, and particularly like this framework is not that well known in the microfinance sector. So it needs like some, some uh, training and some um, introduction on, on this methodology for calculating um, these type of probabilities. So what we saw across these um, frameworks when evaluating was that there is a cross topic among them. One is health that we see like from all, all this, uh, from energy access, from WASH and also from food security, that there are practices that may affect health. And the other one is uh, climate vulnerability. That means that lives can be affected easily by climate. So we are experimenting and see like analyzing all this data and um, we have not like, now I would like to, to show you about this, what we have done with the health analysis. We have created like a health vulnerability index where we are combining the energy access and access to wash indicators that have direct relation with health. For instance, in energy access, there are questions about um, are there injuries caused from the cooking solutions, injuries due to the electricity source, and what are the cooking fuel and stove that could have a direct, um, direct impact on health. And in terms of water, there is like, what is the source of the water? What is the quality of the drinking water and um, availability of it? Um, if there are like shared facilities or not, what are the risks when using the toilet, emptying of the septic, septic tank and the hygiene practices. And here we have found like not calculating, putting some scores on these questions and then, um, and then combining this, this course together, we have uh, the population or these communities analyzed in rural Rwanda were more vulnerable that we could see in, for instance, in Senegal. Um, and no, like more people coping in Nepal and Senegal. And the other, and when comparing this index then um, to other indices such as the education level, um, these are like key qu like questions that everybody will answer. Like what is the, no, what is the education level of, um, of the house, not of the household or person chief of, chief of the household that is interviewed. And we see that um, those that had no educate like non-education level, uh, we see a correlation that it's uh, more vulnerable. Um, so this is like interesting to see. Um, and as well, we have 
like compare it also to the number of children um, and have seen like now when you have more children, you are less vulnerable, but still we need some uh, more in-depth analysis on that data um, just to confirm. And um, here, as you have seen, like we have lots of data from all these communities that we have gathered. So now the questions are like, what's next after um, these data collection processes? So the first thing and what we would like to, um, to streamline with these processes is, is the importance of like how this identification of vulnerabilities can help in the decision-making in order to develop green products or green services by identifying exactly, now let's say on electricity supply or in cooking solutions, um, who is not, not, only, not only do you cook or not uh, with biomass or do you have uh, electricity supply or not, but you know, how, how is that electricity supply? Organizations can see uh, what is the problem? Is it the affordability? Is it like, do they need a backup system? Uh, or do we need to connect those that are illegally connect? Or um, is it about reducing the time of, um, of cooking? Then um, are, what are is this people cooking with two uh, cook stoves? Or do they used to cook with two cook stoves? And are we planning? Is it possible to plan a product where um, an improved cook stove can be offered? Yes or no? So, so this vulnerabilities identification, um, it, it is also a baseline then for a future impact assessment and as well a market study for them to identify what is the potential for specific technologies. And this um, through the, these digital tools where they can have this monitoring of these basic and standard indicators all over the world um, that, or meaning that these same indicators are the ones that uh, can be used like in Haiti or Nicaragua or Senegal, Uganda. Um, then this baseline can, can be used then later for comparing what were the changes if a product or a new service will be implemented or introduced. And here, if the, no, like we have like all these maps uh, for each organization where they can see in their offices how are exactly um, their multi-tier framework index in terms of electricity access, cooking solutions, and, and then like not very detailed household by household, um, then they can see where they changes after a year or after two years of implementation of my products. And this information could also be shared and and discuss with their impact investors that are supporting specific programs and supporting the organizations in their projects. We have feedback from the field. We have reactions of the respondents, feedback of enumerators, perceptions of community needs, learnability and usability of digital tools, field testimonials. And this is data that are still there that um, we need still to analyze. Uh, for each service, we have um, these questions on what were the reactions of, of the households. Also, we have feedbacks of the enumerator, enumerators every day that they were doing the data collections. If their perceptions of what are the needs of the community changed like before the study and after the study, and how is the, how are they coping with um, changing from the analog methods of doing such studies um, changing then to these um, digital apps or like digital tools. And also we have the field testimonials like with recordings and audios for qualitative um, um, data or for, yeah, for thoughts or comments and thoughts that people would like to share. We have also these audios there um, from the numerators. We have also pictures from, um, from households so that we can, it is possible also to identify what are the differences, not only seeing at the numbers, but also already looking at the conditions of um, 
of the cook places, also of the toilets, um, so that institutions can also know, know what are what does it mean to to be in tier zero? What does it mean to increase in this in this um, in this framework of assessment from tier zero to tier one, two, three, four, five? Ideally, that everybody increases in their um, quality of livelihood. And last but not least, um, I would like to share with you, like you now in the next, um, the findings from the employees and these enumerators feedback. Also, we will do like detailed publication and analysis. We will have also a global dashboard, um, like sharing the, the results and, and what are like these um, indicators look like per country. And we will have a next round of call for proposals for microfinance institutions and NGOs that are interested to do these type of studies in December, not this year or January 2022. And um, not from what I have mentioned, from all this data that we have, we have like also research opportunities for, um, for uh, researchers that would like to engage or that would like to focus on this for, for the projects. So this is um, the webinar of today and I'm very happy to answer your questions or going back through the comments of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for this very, very interesting presentation. It went through many, uh, many different aspects of the project. And I think there are uh, certainly several, several questions about it. But for now, our participants seem a bit shy and no one has put any question yet. So while we wait for their questions, um, I was going to ask you a bit, uh, a bit more to just to, to set, set the discussion a bit mm -hmm. more about the background of the project and how these institutions um, uh, one, how is these institutions engaged with the project? Well, what were their motivations? How, how they came to be the ones uh, that, that were, um, that where the projects were implemented? Mm -hmm. um, so we had in February this year, we had a launch of a call for proposals mm -hmm. uh, that was launched in November, in December and closed in February. And we had over 123, like 120 um, applications. So we selected those organizations that um, that had already like experience in in energy access or water and sanitation and hygiene or food security programs that were interested, um, like to expand or to. Uh, to work on these areas. Also that um, the project coordinator, and that's how, that's why I, I mentioned them as, as key participants, um, they have already experience in conducting uh, this type of studies and, and are engaged, like, like I have, um, could have like the take over this responsibility of coordinating teams as mm -hmm. uh, the methodology goes that we train them. You know, we, it's like a train the trainer approach and it needs also a lot of coordination with them and communication. And once we had like a final list of, um, of selected organizations, we also see the vulnerability um, per country. So according, not like what are the rates or how, how urgent it is to, um, to come with solutions in these uh, three spheres, then, um, then those countries will be more favorable than other ones that will be better off than the others. So that's, that's how the, the microfinance institutions and NGO approached us. Okay, uh, when we, have, we have a comment actually from Govinda Raut from Muktinas. Mm -hmm. um, which was one of the institutions that were participating at the project. And, and uh, he is thanking you for the very nice presentation, Natalia, and, and asking you. if you are going to recommend them uh, based on your findings. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, actually, yeah, so we have <laughs> recommenders. Yeah, of course, Govinda. 
Um, so we have we have gone with uh, Vijay and Govinda uh, through their results. And this is one of the topics to discuss also at the action group or WASH, um, as it is a clear some needs on water and sanitation and hygiene and product development. And this is like a conversation now pending. So the, as, as we call the project impact ad, impact driven and action-based research is about establishing collaborations and this is also my role as, um, as co-head of the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group. My, my how do you say, my, my passion, not only about like the work that I do is also like um, bringing people together, like working together and, and this uh, opportunity to connect the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies mm -hmm. with uh, the microfinance institutions doing this, um, doing this research is a, is a first step for the next ones that will come. Mm -hmm. so, just, just to have an idea, and before we, we already have some questions in, in, the, in the question uh, in the section. Q and A section, but just to understand in terms of timings. So you have finished the project with these six uh, institutions. You have communicated the results to them. Um, is there a follow up to this in terms of of the project? In terms of of understanding if they are doing something with the data that I mean with with the results, or or is this a bit more up to each institution to 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 continue the process? Well, the the moment where we are is that the data collection has um, finalized for the organizations, mm -hmm. but um, we are like, so with some of them, we are already closing like on in, st in, the, in the sense of, uh, of the tools, but like they will have access already to all the dashboards and reports, but still like how uh, are we processing the, um, what are like the, me the key main messages and how can they be transformed into recommendation A, B, C, this is a process that still um, is ongoing. Mm -hmm. And we are now applying to another um, project funding so that we can have next year over a six months period for people dedicated to each organization um, for doing a second data collection and also the connections with uh, suppliers, with local NGOs and then also with um, impact investors so that there is like already a team doing a, a semi TA funded by this okay. program to continue the follow up with the organizations. Oh, that, I think that, that's a, I think that's important to know because mm -hmm. even for the for the potential institutions that are thinking of applying to the next uh, round of the project, uh, yeah. knowing that there is the possibility of continuity after, I think that that's an important one. So we mm -hmm. have here one one uh, question from an anonymous attendee. <laughs> that says fantastic presentation and stupendous project. In terms of methodology for data collection, what is your perception to scale this? Will the name writers better be loan officers, field officers of MFIs, or people external to the MFIs? Like or both. Yeah. Um, well, no, so this is, I think, um, from each organization, they have had like very different experiences, mm -hmm. um, whether with internal teams or with external teams or with their loan officers or with um, exclusively hired, um, hired like teams for the data collection. In the I, there are like advantages and disadvantages. Advantages for working directly, like in order to scale up for mm -hmm. an organization as an MFI, if they are working or like the whole infrastructure that they already have with the loan officers, and that's why the approach of providing the digital tools with the to the microfinance institution is because of the facility that it, they have to share the tools, like depending on the level of digitization of the MFI, but for instance, in Nicaragua, um, not they, like they can share from, from one IT, then the tools directly to each of the app of the mobile phones of the loan officers, whether from others that they don't have direct, um, not that there is not like a track record working with the team, but it's like external hard then, 
um, then these processes are, are different. Um, but on the other side, if like a loan officer has already like some, some time that they only, like you now they have these targets and already like a very um, structured mapping or of what do they do each day, which households do they visit, uh, how much time do they spend in each location, then this type of efforts is something that it's like, um, oh, it's an extra effort for the, mm -hmm. for the organization. So there it, it is needed like a whole no, a framework to say this is this is an exception. This is um, not. This is a one project that we are doing for having this baseline. Uh, we need to understand like the needs of our clients, and this is like part of of knowing exactly what is our impact. So it has been also very nice to see from the microfinance institutions. Um, like not only in the whole implementation, but also in the communication with the teams, like you see how social driven they are, um, not the importance and the relevance of saying, um, it is not about like, it is not about um, uh, today about like this payments collection or mm -hmm. uh, going through to the next uh, loan of a client. We want to know, what is going on and where can we help them? And you are this microphone, like not that that person listening to the household is is the microphone of that household calling for action for the only organization covering this this area. So mm -hmm. so they know like their importance that they have in the project. So if it's scalable, it will depend like on how how the microfinance institution sees up sees this and how important it is for them. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Natalia, for the very detailed uh, explanation. Um, we have here a very short question because I think you already kind of replied on on the on when talking about the project. If it's possible to extend this to other countries, I I guess it is because it's part of the of the project. No, uh, is there a limitation in terms of countries that that uh, may apply? No. Okay. So uh, we are, well, the limitation is, um, is uh, we're covering Latin America, Africa, and South Asia. And, and at the end, we want to work with like mo most vulnerable countries. So in, and also organ like the limitation is how motivated is a microfinance institution or organization the most motivated, the better. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Edward Sayers. Um, yeah. Hi, Edward. So uh, according to your experiences, experience, what are the top three environmental which, which risks to which micro-entrepreneurs are exposed? Environmental risks. Um, we are like, well, if we are talking about um, energy, access or cooking solutions um for instance in rwanda there is the lack of of fire like not even uh, every time less firewood so people are exposed and that's the next uh, topic that we are tackling like how climate change um affects the livelihoods and like the vulnerability um we don't we are not we didn't have like questions right directly relating to environmental risks but rather on um if i would like how the availability of fuels the availability of electricity supply um also like if and the availability of water so for for us like the top top um, risk that we saw was the lack of water and that at the beginning we will see um, like the studies will focus or we will uh, think at the beginning that the challenges will be rather on an energy access and at the end it was uh, people need water to drink so that was that was something that also resonates of what is happening in the sector that it's uh, the need of water and sanitation and hygiene um, 
products and funding for this type of programs. And uh, this is key for, for the sector. But I will share with you, Edward, once we have like this climate uh, index and go more in depth on the environmental risks. Mm -hmm. Well, a, a question related because it has to do with the environmental performance as well from the, an anonymous attendee. Uh, how these tools and projects could support MFIs to improve their environmental performance along the standards and decisional practice of forthcoming Green Index 3.0, 3.0, and monitor the outcomes of the intervention with clients. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the um, uh, let let me go to the question exactly. So the the tools, what they do is to provide like empower the institutions to um, be able to assess the vulnerabilities at household level. Once the institution and because there are like um, samples uh, sample sizes that can represent easily like the whole population that the institution is covering, then uh, the institution can have based on this uh, baseline that they have collected already an idea of how how the vulnerabilities are of organizations and how from these vulnerabilities they can think about products and services of the institution to implement. And this, um, this type of processes is already reflected in the Green Index 3.0. And it will be like how in depth you go with the, with the assessment of the vulnerability. It will also, now you can also, um, check in your tool in the Green Index 3.0, which type of assessments or market studies are you conducting? And if this information is supporting the institution for developing a strategy. So yes, it is, it is useful and it is aligned. It will be, uh, if I understood correctly, to be a source of information for the Green Index 0.3.0 yes. and will allow to probably get a better score in the 3.0 because you will have detailed instruments to, or in-depth instruments to, to, to understand mm -hmm. the vulnerabilities of the clients, no? And processes, yes. Yeah. Uh, we have, let me see here, we have a couple of, of um, comments that say that it's very interesting and thank you Natalia for the for the for the presentation mm -hmm. and that they are looking forward to participate in the next round so mm -hmm. we have a comment from Meryl Martin saying that um, also uh, other other comments on that uh, on that uh, line from Bizetsa Bizetsa I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing well the, mm -hmm. the, that um, so that is asking as well if there is any plan to to scale up the intervention so, so that we, they have the opportunity to connect with you. And I think that second round of the project that you were talking about that starts in uh, December this mm -hmm. year yeah. uh, will be probably the, the, the best option. You no, know? so these institutions should contact you, uh, Natalia, or or the project to to know to know uh, a bit more about when when to. To, to apply and what are the conditions, mm -hmm. right? Yes, exactly. And I will, uh, we will do the, the respective promotion of once launched the call for proposals. Um, somebody was asking about the, how, how can it be scaled up this, this type of implementations? And um, we are doing a training in, at the Semana Africana de la Microfinance in Kigali for microfinance institutions about, well, about, about this, um, the frameworks, um, what does it mean on electricity access, uh, on household productive uses, cooking solutions, um, on wash, what are the different aspects to, to evaluate that it doesn't matter from which country like this, mm -hmm. like this, um, these needs are global, like how now if you have or not have, or how is it the quality, this is um, irrelevant from the geography. And we will also um, like to share about you know, what to do, the do's and don'ts, what will be a good strategy for the data collection, depending on the type of institution, on the level of digitization, on the methodologies that they have, whether group loans or individual loans, 
um, how often they, they meet with, um, with the communities, and as well to um, establish collaborations with NGOs and see what are examples of other microfinance institutions that have already implemented these programs, how useful it is to have data, whether it's useful, useful or not, or how it does, um, is it useful for the investors and how investors can also share this data with their investors. Um, so not, not like only concentrating on how much money is it, is it funded, but what is at the end the impact at the households that they are serving, which at the end makes a difference saying how, how, how each of the clients have been helped. And so far this collecting this data is very expensive. And that's why the, not the project as research aims to automatize like all the processes that have been very expensive, expensive so far, so that any organization, in, uh, even working in Sudan, can um, can afford or can have like this um, streamlined and supported easily from other organizations. Okay, that's 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 important, and I think a very good uh, news to know about the, the session in in in, the, in Sun. Mm -hmm. um, I, we have here two questions from Marco Bianchi, and that yeah. also thanks for into the, the presentation. The first one is you well, have 4,000 uh, plus and mm -hmm. uh, more than 4,000 interviews. Do you have a minimum target for future interviews so that the outcomes can be even more relevant uh, and do not suffer and do not suffer possible local conditions from? from uh, and second, uh, how do you plan to involve MFIs in working on the outcomes? Mm -hmm. I think you already partially re replied to that on, on the question from Muktina, but... Uh, yeah, so the, um, the outcomes, like for each microfinance institution, depends on like what is, because we don't do capacity, we don't do the data collection ourselves. It's a data collection from the, um, from the institutions. And the, depending on like the methodologies that they use, they can collect whether uh, the smallest sample size is 400 and the largest is the, their whole, um, their whole client, not their whole portfolio of clients. Um, so also like it, it will depend on the size of the microfinance institution and how feasible it is for them to collect um, not, to the largest amount of, of their clients. Um, so if we have a minimum target for future interventions um, in this selection process selection of the microfinance institutions, they have to say to how many, how many are they targeting, how much um, are they capable or they would like to, uh, to interview. And about the relevance, if, I would say the relevance is per, per microfinance institution in their area of community. So the relevance, it is, a, like, it is already relevant for the organizations and that's the objective of this data collection. So that now, as, as I showed you in Haiti, that they know in Haiti, in all the regions where we cover, these are exactly the needs. So how, um, how we involve them in working with the outcomes is to show them as simple as possible and as easy as possible, the frameworks, no, I, I will go now with this, so for instance, these are the frameworks for uh, electricity supply and for cooking solution. And these are the ones that are, have been published by the SMAP from the World Bank. So we take them and transfer them into very simple questions. No, um, what does it mean exposure? What does it mean convenience? What does it mean mm -hmm. uh, primary cookstoves? And with these automated reports, so let me, let me go back. With the automated reports that they can already like see, seeing every day what is happening. Maybe here, no? like what is the main source of electricity? And this this type of reports, what we are doing is um, is to show like not the first version it was without colors, then the second uh, had some colors, and the third version had already like look at these numbers that are more. Um, that are like the maximum 
mm -hmm. numbers. So every time we are like improving in the visibility of the data, because at the end, it's a lot of data that they are gathering and how to be digestible. Uh, this data for the institutions is with the combination of the dashboards and the reports. So that's like, that's the strategy that we are having now. And the next one is to, is like by doing the training from the bottom, like from the bottom saying to the, from the loan officers that they understand what are they asking, which are these, like, which are these um, areas of assessments and then from the loan office, also the project coordinators, and then up so, so that everybody is informed on the needs. Mm -hmm. We have a, a couple more questions. One is, and it's a bit long, so I, let's see. So it's from Maina Kihu, and it's uh, my question um, or concern is from field practice, I have implemented WASH projects both software and hardware components in vulnerable communities in Kenya to address the eradication of open defecation in meadows in flung areas. Whereas mm -hmm. communities are eager to change, the challenge remains in accessing and affordability of major infrastructure connections like sewer lines, main grid power, wind power, water piping, which can only be provided by the government. Mm -hmm. So how do you foresee the solution for, all, for this challenge? Do you plan to work closely or engage respective governments? That's a challenging question. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, it is. It is. So, so far, what we can do from the from the ISS is to draw on policy briefs and policy recommendations, and then we can also engage, like invite and share these results with, um, with local. Uh, municipalities, like for instance, this is one of the projects that we have conducted. I didn't show here is in Colombia, doing because we only did their um, electricity supply assessment, and this is shared then with the local um, governmental like municipality, and also shared with the electrical electricity utility, where the electricity utility they are sure that everybody is in tier five and everybody is already connected but then like looking more into detail and um, with the needs of the households it is seen that not some illegal connections or there are outages or they're like the fluctuation of the electricity is damaging the electricity the electrical equipments of the households and this information when shared with um now with their respective with their respective authorities, then there are like some, then there are some lights. Okay, now we have to focus on this, and this is how we should work together. Uh, not now, if there is an electricity extension, where exactly? And this is something that we are sharing with um, with the local municipalities. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, because we work, so we work, we are just um, an intermediate in technology. Mm -hmm. um, it is also something that we will support in the establishing these collaborations with the microfinance institutions, um, and but not directly, uh, like not directly sharing, sharing with the governments um, themselves, but maybe like establishing the collaborations, or um, through this publication sharing results. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Natalia, for. For, for the answer. Uh, I'm going to give the, the floor. So Bizetsa Bizetsa has a couple of, of questions. So I'm going to give him uh, time to talk. So if you can unmute yourself, you can you can ask um, you can ask the questions yourself. So we have okay. here Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you first for the, the presentation and uh, the project you are doing. Thank you. It's, it's really, really needed. And I know you are responding to many, many problems within uh, different communities where you are serving. Yeah, um, I wanted just to know, um, as uh, we are also serving uh, communities in uh, such kind of uh, vulnerability, so is is no there is no option of capacity building of uh, 
your partner organizations because you know um, when we are going to do a kind of need assessment we need to to get a, a kind of understanding a same or a same understanding with you so mm -hmm. is there any option of capacity building of your partner organizations that was my first question and yeah. my second one uh, can i continue asking the, 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 the both questions so you can respond at once yes you can um so about the capacity building we are we are developing we are developing these training materials and we are going to upload them in impact our website and we are going to do this training also like physical training um, at the at the sam and and we have been also publishing like the questionnaires the tools all what is missing is um like the whole capacity building on the um, understanding, like how the frameworks work. Although the uh, food and agriculture organization, like on the FAO, already have like very good material. What we will need is to bring this material like to a place where people can have access to it. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So my last my my last questions was. Yes. Um, um, I, I wanted just to know um, the average of interviewees per project, uh, as you, you 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 presented in your presentation, like uh, six uh, six uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted yes, I wanted to know uh, how many how what what is the average of interviewees per project. Uh, um, and its relevance in informing the vulnerability uh, level within a given community. What, mm -hmm. what or in other terms, um, what, um, uh, what is considered, uh, what, how many inter, uh, inter, interviewees do you consider as relevant to, to inform the, the vulnerability uh, level within a given community. Yeah, um, we have. So it depends on how fast you want to do the this this one shot picture. Um, like for instance, in Rwanda, there was a team of five um, five interviewers, and they did in two weeks nonstop this uh, data collection. In other cases. We have had uh, larger teams of up to 10 where they spend like some months in doing data collection every day, some few, um, some few interviews according to the, yeah, to the schedules that they had as, um, as loan officers in the microfinance institution or, uh, or extreme cases, uh, for instance, in Uganda where, where we had like a, different teams uh, per region. And one team was over 70, 70 people doing the data collection. So we had in, like in, in, in one Telegram chat, like over 70 people doing at the same time um, the service in the field. So it depends oh. from organization and what they can manage to handle and coordinate and the availability oh. of time and resources, yeah, like of time of, of the people uh, for doing the, the study. Uh, I may be used, uh, I may be confused the, 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 the terms. I didn't want to know interviewers, the number of interviewers. I wanted to know the number of interviews or the, 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 uh, how, the, the sample. <laughs> Okay. Ah, the sample. Yeah, it varies yes. from uh, a minimum, a uh, minimum of four hundred. So, yeah. So because we want like this statistical uh, significance, we have per microfinance institution or per organization, it should be at least uh, four hundred 
uh, data points. In the case of Rwanda, we went below this number, like with a slight, slight um, larger uh, error. But the communities had also, besides the sample, also focus groups so that we can validate um, like the data and the results that we were having from, from the individual households. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, thank you for, for your questions. We are a bit out bit uh, later than, than the, 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 final, the final schedule. So I would ask uh, Natalia to, um, th there is one more question uh, in the Q&A um, um, that has to do with uh, the, the, or more of, of a comment of the, the tool being under the micro European Microfinance pl Platform might not attract institutions for other parts of the developing world. Uh, so I think first, and I can answer a, part, a bit, and, and Natalia can complement. Uh, so this project is not a project of the European Microfinance Platform, it's a project of the uh, Institute of um, Advanced Sustainability Studies at, the, uh, at, at Potsdam, where Natalia is the research fellow. So we are, um, we are communicating and, and making the, the, the mem, the, the, the microphone institutions and other stakeholders uh, know about the project and and, and understand what, what it is about. Um, so Natalia, I don't know if you want to complement anything else, but... Um... Yeah, I think there was one question uh, of, of Davide uh, Castellani. Hi, mm -hmm. Davide. Um, about like this um, supply and demand, if we're only analyzing demand, we have done also on the supply side, we are doing this study about like uh, which suppliers are there for um, electricity, like for the different technologies, also on water, if there are like which NGOs are working. Um, but this is like this desk study that we haven't yet shared um, or published as we want to know, like already like doing this stakeholder mapping that is also part of Impactar, and that we will also like to engage uh, researchers to uh, to do like this profound uh, this study assessment. So what we have done is uh, it's a very just like a brief overview of, from the supply side, but it will need also a more in depth assessment in each country. Thanks, Natalia. I think we are going about to close. Any other questions you have in the last slide? As you can see, the contacts from Natalia at the at, at Potsdam uh, and also at at Ebera. Mm -hmm. um, please feel free to contact her and hopefully to to apply for the second round um, to the second round of the of of the of the project. Uh, so we have even more diversified examples and and uh, experience to learn from. Um, so thanks, Natalia, for, for this uh, very interesting presentation and all of you, you for, for joining us today. Thank you. Goodbye to all. And thanks for being here. Also, thanks to Govinda that for him has, might be very late. <laughs>